on Business Incorporated today. Chief Angola crude signals China's oil demand may continue to stay weak in the coming months. And Algeria threatens to cut gas to Spain amid Morocco tensions. Plus, South Sudan and Japan signed $23 million deal on infrastructure development. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Will Ebong. We check in first with major equities in Africa where sentiments were positive at intraday. Nigeria and South Africa exchanges traded up. Nigeria's index was up 0.41%, maintaining the bullish move in the week. Also, South Africa's JSE climbed almost 2%. Egypt's benchmark performance index jumped more than 3%. Meanwhile, the Nairobi Stock Exchange closed Wednesday's session negative. Over to the Middle East, where sentiments were po mostly positive at intraday. The Abu Dhabi index traded up 1.02%, while Dubai's index rose 0.46%. Elsewhere in the region, Saudi Arabia and the Qatari indexes traded in different territories with Saudi index up by 0.6% and the Qatari index down 0.04% each at intraday. Now to Europe. After yesterday's announcement that Russia's state-owned energy giant Gazprom is halting gas deliveries to Bulgaria and Poland, the European Commission has accused Moscow of blackmail. Chris Kober is right there in Berlin to give us an update. Now, Chris, Russia cut gas deliveries to two EU and NATO member states yesterday. How concerned is the government in Berlin that the Kremlin could turn off the gas taps for Germany as well? Political leaders here in Germany are concerned, although gas flows are at a stable level overall at the moment, a spokesperson for the economy ministry said. Still, the cutoff and the Kremlin warning that other countries could be next sent shivers of worry through the 27-nation European Union. EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen calling the cuts unjustified and unacceptable, and German President Frank-Walter Steinmeier echoing von der Leyen in calling calling Russia's suspension of gas exports a blackmail attempt. So far, though, the opinion in Berlin seems to be prevailing that turning off the taps on major consumers like Germany or Italy, for that matter, is something that the Kremlin is shying away from until this point. Uh, nevertheless, Germany and Italy, too, have been taking steps to reduce their dependence on Moscow. Now, Gazprom said it shut off Bulgaria and Poland because they refused to pay in rubles, as La President Vladimir Putin has demanded of what he called unfriendly nations. Now, the Kremlin said other countries may be cut off if they don't agree uh, to the payment arrangement. Most European countries have publicly uh, denied this demand from Russia, but it is not clear how many have actually faced the moment of decision so far. Greece's next scheduled payment to Gazprom is due on May 20, 25th, for example, and the government must decide then whether to comply or not. Mm. This is something definitely for us to be concerned about. But Germany's government has lowered its economic outlook for the year. How is Europe's biggest economy expected to perform? At a considerably lower level than uh, thought only a couple of months ago, the go uh, German government on Wednesday lowered its uh, 2022 economic growth forecast to 2.2 percent against the backdrop of risks associated with the war in Ukraine. Now, in its annual economic report at the beginning of the year, the government had predicted a GDP increase of 3.6 percent in the year. The economy ministry cited the Russian war in Ukraine as the main reason for the gloomer outlook. High energy prices, sanctions, and increased uncertainty are where
weighing on growth prospects. After two years of dealing with the coronavirus pandemic, Russia's war adds a new burden, Economy Minister Robert Habeck said, adding that the war against Ukraine and its economic impact reminded the country that Germany is vulnerable. Now, GDP growth estimate for 2023 was also revised down to 2.5%. An inflation of 6.1% is expected for the current year, with a significantly healthier 2.8% predicted for the coming year. Mm. So, how are the financial markets faring today with the news the that they've gotten? The mood has uh, brightened somewhat, uh, fueled by a swath of better-than-expected earnings figures. German stocks are rebounding this morning. Germany's blue chips index DAX advancing around 1% uh, in early trading. It is not only quarterly earnings figures that investors are keeping their eyes on today. Later in the day, the Federal Statistics Office will publish will publish its inflation assessment uh, for this month. Now, fueled by massive increases in energy prices, uh, the inflation rate in Germany climbed to 7.3 percent last month, its highest level in around 40 years, and that has become a real issue to consumers and companies, um, the German government just yesterday agreed on a relief package for the public worth billions. Uh, it includes temporary lowering taxes on fuels and also, and also employees are to get a one-time payment of 300 euros or around $320. And the government decided on a subsidized ticket uh, that would allow people to use local public transport uh, at a discounted price uh, for around three months. Now, the hope is that people will decrease the use of their own cars during the summer months, lowering their energy consumption and expenses as well as helping the fight against climate change. So the issue of rising prices remains high on the political and public agenda, and we'll see how inflation has been faring this month later in the day. Mm. Thanks, Chris, for that update. We will keep an eye as well. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Now to the UK, where inflation rises, prices are also top of the agenda, with former Bank of England policymaker Adam Posen pointing fingers at Brexit. Let's talk to Juliana in London. Hi, Juliana. Good afternoon, Will. Hi. So 80% of inflation has been blamed on Brexit. How come? Yeah, this is a pretty um, interesting assessment by, as you said, the former uh, Bank of England um, Central Monetary Policy uh, member, Adam Posen, who was speaking um, to a forum um, at his position in the Pearson Institute, which is a very, very influential uh, research group based in Washington. And now I'm sure his comments are pretty uncomfortable uh, listening uh, to Prime Minister Boris Johnson, because we do have our own local elections taking place um, next week, which is going to really determine how people are viewing uh, the Prime Minister. And Brexit um, is a reason why uh, Posen does believe uh, that inflation and the cost of living is particularly acute within the UK. Now, you remember last week the International Monetary Fund um, downgraded its forecast of the British economy for next year, actually putting us in the lowest uh, ranking of G7 nations, which isn't good. And there are uh, lots of reasons as to why this is happening um, to the UK. Now, he has mentioned Brexit because we know, of course, once we left uh, the customs Customs Union um, and the single market, um, we are basically on our own. And when other countries are uh, recovering from the pandemic within the continent, they are able to forge uh, new relations together, whereas the UK is focusing uh, predominantly on going around the world, trying to uh, get these free trade deals. We know recently the Prime Minister was in India uh, trying to uh, solidify a new relationship there, and this is having a knock-on effect. Now, the labour market was 
also an area of interest uh, for Posen in his speech uh, last night because according to the Office for National Statistics, we have a record high number of vacancies here in the UK. One of the major reasons for that is because of migration. Lots of workers that we used to have working in the hospitality sector left because of Brexit. Many of them also left uh, during the pandemic and that's left a really big hole and that is having a knock-on effect, a knock-on effect on staffing, a knock-on effect um, on uh, supply chain issues and disruption. So really interesting uh, a set of data uh, from a set of sentiment from uh, Posen in Washington last night and it'd be interesting to see whether this is picked up uh, by the Labour Party or indeed voters come next Thursday when the local elections take place. Mm, Juliana, this is definitely hard news to chew at this time, you know, difficult times we are in. But how are the markets reacting to all this? Yeah, the markets, uh, considering um, what's happening a thousand miles away or thousands of miles away in Russia, um, are, are pretty uh, decent um, at intraday. Uh, the, the blue chip index is trading in positive territory. We are at the time where lots of companies are updating. I think uh, the Meta uh, trading update, Meta being the parent company now of Facebook, they actually posted pretty robust uh, data. Their share price was up 21% in Wall Street, and that's had a knock-on effect on global markets. So the FTSE all share at intraday is up by 0.97 percent. The FTSE 100 is also up by 0.95 percent and the FTSE 250 up too. That's up by triple digit figures 1.08 percent. In the currencies market the British pound is currently trading down against the US dollar by 0.36 percent though it's trading up on the euro by 0.06 percent and up on the Japanese yen too by 1.18 percent. Oh, so Juliana, that's good news to know about the market. Now we come to all the streaming services. We, you know, with the recent news of Netflix not posting um, good results and also losing subscribers, UK is, is tightening, you know, regulations for these streaming services. Uh, what's new about that? Well, yeah, it's it's an um, it's it's a long time coming, uh, really. Lots of uh, the legislative. Um, uh, uh, laws in place in the UK as it pertains to governing uh, tech companies um, are pretty much outdated, especially during the pandemic. We know that consumer habits changed, uh, particularly when it comes to streaming. Streaming services are very, very prominent in the UK now. Lots of individuals, particularly the young, are no longer watching traditional TV, which the government is able to have an oversight of uh, through Ofcom, which is uh, the TV uh, regulator. But now Nadine Doris who is the culture secretary as she has announced um, these new uh, legislative uh, measures which are going to tackle just what um, these tech companies these streaming platforms are putting in front of viewers with an aim really of making sure that viewers are protected so they're not watching too much extreme uh, footage footage that could lead to mental health and suicide there have been so many uh, Netflix um, uh, seasons over the past couple of years that some people have said have had undue harm and effect on children. Uh, so these new proposals do have to go through Parliament. But like I said, this is just a reason to kind of overturn these decades old laws and put them in line with the times that we're living in now, which is very much um, app based. Hmm. Thank you so much, Juliana, for that update. Really um, parental control. Things are really looking well sideways these days, but we hope that we get positive news soon. Thank you so much, Juliana, for coming on. Thank you. Over to Asia, where stocks were largely higher in today's trade as investors in the region watch for market reaction to the Bank of Japan's latest monetary policy decision. Mainland Chinese stocks closed mixed, with the Shanghai Composite rising 0.58%, while the Shenzhen Composite dipped 0.2%. In Hong Kong, the Hang Seng Index jumped about 1.4% higher as of its final hour of trading. Also, the Nikkei 225 in Japan led gains among the region's major markets today, rising 1.75% to close, while the Topics Index climbed 2.09%. Elsewhere, South Korea's Kospi advanced 1.08% to finish the trading day, while the Australia Index gained 1.32%. Stock futures in the U.S. jumped in early trading on Thursday as the market tried to recover some of the ground lost during this month's sell-off and investors reacted to positively to earnings from meta platforms. Futures on the Dow Jones Industrial Average 
added 0.86 percent, S&P 500 futures gained 1.48 percent, and Nasdaq 100 futures jumped 2.02 percent. The pre-market moves followed a volatile session on Wednesday that saw the Nasdaq Composite stoop to its lowest level in 2022 as stocks look to bounce back from a tech-led April sell-off. Investors are also awaiting big tech earnings later today from Apple, Amazon and Twitter along with results from Robinhood. Jobless claims are also due out today. Up next, updates from the commodities market and that's in a moment to stay with us. Welcome back. Coal is an important resource used heavily in electricity generation, steel production, and cement manufacturing. However, with rising global crude oil prices, the price of coal has also risen sharply, reaching an all-time high of $325.50 per ton in April. To discuss this with me is Olua Sheyu Miodora, analyst at Financial Derivatives Company. Hi, Sheyi. Good to have you. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me today. So we're seeing a coal cool renaissance, I'll call it a coal cool renaissance, following uh, rising global crude prices. Also, coal burning in the U.S. is in the midst of its biggest revival in a decade, while China is reopening shuttered mines and has cut tariffs on coal imports. How much of a setback is this revival to the U.N.'s objective to achieve net zero emissions by 2050? Okay, so yes, what we need to um, look at basically is the reasons um, for this um, coal revival. And it is highly linked to the um, raging conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Um, and this is basically a knock-on effect also of the um, rising energy needs of so many people after reopening, um, upon re um, lifting of restrictions from the pandemic. And subsequently, energy needs rose sharply, and this led to the increase in prices of natural gas. Now, um, coal is basically one of the cheapest sources of energy, and because of the rising cost of um, having to power their stations, so many businesses, so many um, corporates now had to um, look basically for a cheaper source of energy. And this was why um, so many people settled on coal. It's way cheaper than crude oil or even natural gas. And this is basically the reason behind the increase in coal prices that we have seen lately. And regarding how much of an effect it is, how much of a setback it is to the UN's um, objectives of achieving net zero by 2050, um, largely it depends on how um, much of a decrease in green energy investments and increase in investments in coal would cause. Because if there's no commensurate decrease and there are more or there's more of an increase in green energy in line with um, what the objectives of the UN is, then I'm not sure it's so much of a setback. But to the extent that we have no insight into exactly how much investments are going into green energy and coal, but we know for a fact that um, coal investments are currently increasing, then of course we can say, looking at that alone, I say it's a bit of a setback. But if there is a much more commensurate investment in green energy, then I don't think it's so much of a setback in that regard. Okay, so let's bring it back. Let's bring it back home. Nigeria's coal reserves are estimated at 2.8 billion metric tons, but it produces approximately 44,452 metric tons of coal annually. In the wake of the renewed global interest and investment in coal mining and other related infrastructure, to what extent can Nigeria leverage its coal deposits? Okay, so what we need to look at here basically is um, the lead time between investing in coal mining and production and how quickly we can bring it to market, how long it's going to take. And this basically differs depending on what regulations are within the jurisdiction you are trying to mine and produce are. Now, um, basically in Nigeria, what we need to look at now for a fact is for our own local consumption, we have more than um, sufficient gas reserves to basically power our domestic consumption. And to that extent, I'm not so sure that it would be wise to go the route of coal because um, we know for a fact that it's also going to um, need renewed investment in coal. 
and subsequently um, there's going to be a lot of um, infrastructure we have so many uh, so much infrastructural deficits in that particular um, regard and there needs to be new investments it's also going to have to be maintained and all of this is going to cost significant money whereas um, for LNG where we have um, so much energy, um, LNG exports, as well as we have so much to uh, meet our domestic demand, then it's more or less having to tilt towards that and basically improve on our deployment of resources to LNG than towards coal. So I think that's what we should do in Nigeria, basically. Okay, so given that the Nigerian government still has plans to revive the Ajal Kuta Iron and Steel Mill, and has expended nearly 20 billion naira in the last six years on the facility's maintenance. What effects will the plans for Ajao Kuta's revival have on the country's sustainability efforts? And how does the government intend to attract funding for this project? That's, that's an interesting question because, as we know, Nigeria also um, made commitments at the COP26 um, at the COP26 um, summits that are held in October, November last year to decrease domestic emissions. So to the extent that we are seeking funding for the Agile Kuta steel mill, which also in steel manufacturing coal is an important resource. So it's having to look for a way to make sure that we are also seeking to um, invest rapidly in green energy initiatives such that we are not negligent in our pledges that were made to the UN during the COP26 um, summit that held last year because so many developed countries are currently applying that route as well as because we have energy needs that need to be met today and alternative energy um, investments or switching to alternative energy too quickly um, is, incred is incredibly expensive but we have energy needs that need to be met today and fossil fuels are still are still needed basically in the world um, to meet those energy demands. And we also need to be able to exploit some of the resources that we have. But to the extent that we can't do that without having to increase our investments or looking into alternative energy and increasing investment in that regard. And I think that's what needs to be done in Nigeria as well. Thank you so much, uh, Midiora, Sheyo Midiora, for sharing your thoughts with us, uh, analyst at Financial Derivatives Company. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, still in the commodities space, Angolan crude is currently being offered for exports at lower than usual prices, a signal that top consumer China's oil demand may struggle to rebound in the coming months. According to experts, China's energy demand has been hit by lockdowns aimed at curbing the spread of COVID-19 and supplies offered at lower prices indicate that recent weaker demand from the world's biggest crude importer may persist into June. Angola state-owned oil company Sunangol has offered to sell a cargo of Dahlia crude for June, loading at a discount of 50 cents a barrel to the dated Brent oil benchmark, that's down from a premium of as much as $1.60 a barrel above the benchmark being offered for similar supplies in May. Angola also faces stiffer competition in Europe, another of its main markets, as supplies return from Libya and the CPC export terminal on Russia's Black Sea coast. West Africa's crude exports to China are set to dip this month, according to experts as well. Now, Algeria has warned that it would terminate gas supplies to Spain if Madrid sold any Algerian gas to other countries amid tensions with neighboring Morocco. Spain's energy ministry had confirmed it planned to ship gas to Morocco, but stressed that none of that gas would be of Algerian origin. However, Algerian Energy and Mines Minister Mohamed Abkarb says that any routing of Algerian natural gas delivered, delivered to Spain, whose destination is none other than that provided for in the contract, will be considered as a breach of contractual commitments. Spain depends on Algeria, Africa's largest gas exporter for gas supplies, most of it, it, most of it which it receives through the 750-kilometer Megdas deep water pipeline. And in 2021, Sonatrack supplied more than 40% of Madrid's natural gas imports. South Sudan and Japan have signed a grand deal of $23.3 million for infrastructure development in the world's youngest nation. The multi-year project includes the reconstruction of four bridges, roads, as well as a consulting service to ensure the road traffic safety and expand the traffic volume. 
South Sudan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs says Japan's contribution would promote economic and social development in the country. On his part, the, char the Chargé d'Affaires of Japan, Mr. Toyama Mitsuri, says the project will also see many South Sudanese engineers trained on various technologies necessary for the sustainable development of the African youngest nation. Now, gold prices reached a 10-week low early on Thursday as elevated U.S. dollar hurt demand for the greenback price bullion, while an impending Federal Reserve interest rate hike also dented the metal's appeal as an inflation hedge. Spot gold traded as low as $1,877.18 per ounce, its lowest since February the 16th. The metal later rebounded to trade 0.2% higher at $1,889.50 while U.S. gold futures manage a small gain to trade at $1,890.70. With gold prices falling, failing to push higher despite a backdrop of the Ukraine war and rapid inflation, investors have probably decided to look elsewhere. And that's it on the program today. I'm Will Bunk. Thanks for watching.